yesterday. I was enriched and blessed by all that came. And for you, you who couldn't make it, by golly, we'll have another one next summer and uh, come see us now. I also found out I'm not nearly as good at playing badminton as I thought. <laughs> Are there other announcements? <clears throat> all right. Please join me in the prayer of preparation. Oh, precious Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus. Thank you for showing us the keys to the kingdom of God. Guide our hearts and our minds as we worship today, so that what you have said so long ago becomes real in our hearts. Teach us to build on a solid foundation of all that we do. Amen.
two foundations. There are only two choices with Jesus, friends. You are either with him or you are not. There is no pluralism here. Pluralism is that modern philosophy that says, I'm okay, you're okay, everything is okay as long as it doesn't bother me personally. Made famous by Oprah. C.S. Lewis went through this phase in his journey to Christ. He said, I was soon altering I believe to I feel. And that quickly led to higher thought and intellectual snobbery where nothing needs to be obeyed and nothing needs to be believed except that which is either comforting or exciting. Make no mistake, when you talk about the narrow way to the pluralists who are so common today, you sound naive, ridiculous, hick, and unsophisticated. But you do sound like Jesus. Proverbs 14.12 says there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Why did? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 14.6. Narrow gate. Proverbs 30.12 says there is a generation of those who are pure in their own eyes and yet unwashed in their filth. Why gate? Luke 13, 24, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Narrow gate. This is one of the great themes in the Bible. Choose the narrow gate. Don't be like everyone else. Be a people set aside for God and live like that. Virtually the entire Old Testament, if you distill it down, is one story after another of the Israelites choosing the wide gate to be just like everybody else and God mercifully rescuing them when that leads to disaster. A modern wide path choice for churches has been to decide if we should present the gospel in a more tolerant, more entertaining way to make it more appealing. Should we avoid the Old Testament altogether and jazz up the service with rock music and a light show? <coughs> Why did And not what Jesus was about. In truth, the longer Jesus preached, the fewer people followed him. John 6, 66 through 69 says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You want to go as well? And Simon Peter answered him in a moment of clarity, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Narrow path. Back in the last century, there was a popular TV show called The Fugitive. You can still find the Harrison Ford movie, but it doesn't have quite the same focus. I was a fan of the TV show. In that series, Dr. Richard Kimball was convicted of murdering his wife and was relentlessly pursued by law enforcement. He was innocent, and in every episode, he is about to be caught, and he is confronted with a choice. Does he stay with the little old lady he had promised to help, even though the cops are closing in and she will slow him down, or does he leave her stranded and go off to save himself? Does he join the gang of thieves for a sure getaway or stay alone and go on his own way? <laughs> Wide gate, narrow gate, every week. Had he gone by himself in that first example, he would have run directly into the cops. But a nice young man traveling with a little old lady did not fit the picture that the cops had of a, a fugitive from justice. And she yelled at the cops beyond that, and he passed through. In the second example, if he had gone with the thieves, he would have been caught because the cops were already on to them. They didn't know it, but they, they were, and he would have been caught. He says to those, the fugitive says to those thieves, if I am not against you, I'm for you, and if I'm for you, I'm lost. That might sound familiar to you. You hear it in Matthew 12, 30, 
Luke 950 and Mark 940. Narrow way. I must be with you. Take time before you choose things of this world. Think them through. If he had decided to go with the thieves, even if he had escaped, he'd have wound up with a bunch of thieves and murderers. How does that work out? Take time. Now to be clear, Jesus does not promise earthly rewards from the narrow way. This is not a pathway to prosperity and health. It's not a tele-evangelism pitch. It is not the safest, nor is it the most popular path. And in truth, most people don't even find it. The broad path is often the status quo. It's the way that's socially acceptable. Everybody's doing it. Blaise Pascal has said, the highest order, order of mind is accused of folly, and so is the lowest. Nothing is thoroughly approved except mediocrity. The majority has established this, and it fixes its fangs on whatever gets beyond it either way. Even the cross, a symbol of our faith, has become decorative jewelry in this society and not the symbol of sacrificial living that it once represented. It has become socially accepted. So here's the first point of this sermon. It's the destination of the path that's the most important thing in the long run. Choose to step off the broad path and enter the narrow and difficult one. And we must do this every day. Take time to think things through. Where does this path take you? A person can fall in love with anyone but you must choose to become married. So how do you know if the gate is narrow? Test its fruit. What does it bring to you in the end? There must be more than momentary pleasure for the path to qualify as narrow. Are you a better person following this road? That's the idea. And let's be clear right now, this path is not about following a bunch of religious rules, or doctrines. The narrow gate is about obedience and the confidence in Jesus every day that comes from obedience. It's not about rules. Jed Magruder, back in the last century after the Watergate scandal, said we had conned ourselves into thinking we weren't doing anything really wrong. And by the time we were doing things that were obviously illegal, we had lost control. We had gone from poor ethical behavior into illegal activities without even realizing it. Here's another point. We can convince ourselves of almost anything in the moment. So for big decisions in our lives, take time to think it through, read the Bible, pray about it, and if in doubt, seek the advice of good Christian friends. Sometimes the narrow gate is easier to find if you have a guide. But heaven forbid, what if I've chosen the wide gate? Am I doomed? Well, there's a bit of good news for us here, friends. The gate that leads to life is too small for us to bring our baggage. There's no room for self-promotions, our good works, our inflated egos, our acts of righteousness, but we also can't bring our fears, our burdens, our guilt, or our self-doubt. I'm, you can only bring Jesus. He knows we'll miss the path now and again. Go to him and he'll lead you back. On to two treats. I've already said that we can convince ourselves of almost anything these days, and it's worth repeating. You may think you are on the narrow path, but you just can't say that you like Jesus. There are those who say things believers say and even do things believers do. And in reality, it's all fake. A wise saying goes, you can judge a man pretty well by whether, if given a choice, he would ask for a light burden or a strong back. Check the fruit. Just because you know the name of Jesus and say Christian things does not mean you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. The battle cry of the Reformation back in the day, which was started by Martin Luther and was the beginning of all the Protestant faiths, says that we are saved by grace alone, 
through faith alone, in Christ alone. You'll hear me say that more than once as I preach to you. That's another important point. There is nothing else but Jesus. But faith that saves cannot remain alone. By that grace, God produces fruit in us. What, what must I do to get this fruit? No, 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 no. This is the fruit of the Spirit. We don't do anything for this. It is a free gift of God. Remember them? Joy, peace, love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 20-22-23. Ron has a song about that one too, but we're going to put that up to another song. So look at the lives of people. How do they really treat other people? Are they arrogant? Are they bullies? Do they have joy and the other fruit? Do they do unto others? Matthew 7, 12, also a part of the Sermon on the Mount, but not included in this series, says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Pay attention to the fruit. Jesus goes on to tell this great story of two builders and two homes. Building a home is a big deal and involves lots of decision making and money. And the most important decision is not granite common house versus marble. The most important decision is the land on which the house is built. For my father, that needed to be well-drained land at an elevation so that the water would not pour into your basement. When we lived in Chicago back in the day, a flooded basement was a real possibility with every heavy duty. My brother, for some inexplicable reason, bought a house on the little Calumet River in the south suburbs. If he had heard Dad's passionate rule about property, he had forgotten it. They lived beautifully for a little while, and then the river flooded and destroyed two levels of his home. Talk about post-traumatic stress. He carried the stress of that example with him for the rest of his life. So, elevated, well-drained, not by a river. Preferably with solid rock underneath. But building on solid rock is expensive. Building on sand is cheap. Sandy property is cheap. You can build with cheap materials. Look at virtually any of the house flipping shows on TV. That's actually a category of house nowadays, a flip house, which is code for all pretty finishes and cheap as can be on everything that you can't see. When the storms of life come, that flip house with poor drainage on sandy soil built with cheap materials will not stand. We all understand, I think, that storms in life go together. There is always a B-side to life. Remember the old 45 records? Most of you do, there are a few that don't. Those were the little records, and what they did was they had one side that was the current most awesome tune possible. And the other side, called the B-side, well, had a song that nobody knew, cared about, or had anything to do with. <laughs> If you look on social media, everyone posts their A signs. When we come to church, or the bank, or the office, or to school, you just see the A sign. But make no mistake, everybody's got a B sign. Everybody is dealing with something. We cannot steer clear of it. So we need to learn the secret of enduring without seeking, sinking, standing strong without collapsing. Building a solid house. This is a crucial lesson for people to learn today as rates of suicide, anxiety, and depression all skyrocket. How do we stand firm when the world around us seems to be falling apart? With this parable, Jesus is emphasizing that obedience to his word and his interpretation of the law is solid when everything else is sinking. Jesus speaks with the authoritative voice of the living God. This is a foundational benefit of the Christ following life. When times get tough, you have a solid foundation. It's time to call attention to the simple wisdom of that modern proverb. When all else fails, follow directions. 
Jesus gave us the directions. Just do that. The Sermon on the Mount now demands action. Thinking Jesus is a cool teacher, nice talk, is not enough. You must choose the narrow road and act on that every day of your life. So who is this person that builds their house on the rock? How do you do it? Let's read you. First, the person uh, with his house on the rock is the one who hears the words of Jesus and acts on it. Only following Jesus provides a solid foundation. There's nothing else in this world that can. Then, watch for those who are doing the same thing. Those with their homes on the rock. This ministry has many of them, and I've been privileged to see them. You see them in times of trial. They're the ones that aren't overwhelmed by it. They're the ones that don't disappear into depression. Those are the ones that have joy, even when life is falling around, uh, falling around them. Lives that started on a wide path can switch to the narrow and become transformed by the grace of God and get a new nature. <coughs> Peter and Paul are poster examples of this, but you can find them all through Scripture. Those who start, start out lost or miserable and poof, get new life. One more parable from modern times, friends. A minister, a boy scout, and a computer expert were the only pa passengers on a small plane. The pilot came back to the cabin and said that the plane was going down, but there were only three parachutes for four people. The pilot added, I should have one of the parachutes because I have a wife and three small children. So he took one and jumped. The computer whiz said, well, I should have one of the parachutes because I'm the smartest man in the world and everyone needs me. So he took one and jumped. The minister turned to the Boy Scout and with a sad smile said, You are young and I have lived a rich life, so you take the remaining parachute and I'll go down with the plane. The Boy Scout smiled and said, Relax, Pastor. The smartest man in the world just picked up my backpack and jumped down. <laughs> Blind gate. Bad choice. <laughs> when Jesus finished speaking, the people knew that they had heard something amazing. They were left speechless. Chuck Swindoll would say, Jesus taught the truth as the one who is the truth in everything that he did. He taught the law as the one who originally delivered it at Sinai. He taught from divine authority that was uniquely his. Does that give anybody else chills? Yes. Everyone went home that day and had to decide whether they would choose the wide gate and gather at the town water fountain and talk about this great TED talk they had heard, or whether they would actually choose the narrow gate and follow Jesus. What will we do? If we choose the narrow gate, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? I'm glad you asked. Next week, we'll start a six-week series called The Call, and we will explore what it truly means to follow Jesus Christ. Now, I know that next Sunday starts the Vernon County Fair. So, if you can't make it to church, and I encourage you to, but if you can't, watch that sermon online because it creates the foundation for the entire series. One more thing. We can't finish this sermon without a song. I went to Methodist Sunday School and I didn't hear this one, but I tell you, this parable is a foundation for one of the great Sunday School songs ever. Take it away, Ron. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do motions with it. You can join in once you get them. Okay? <laughs> the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm.
foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went splash. <laughs> Amen. Good job, Rod. Do that. 
but we. We also pray, Father God, for grandparents, but also for schools, for all that go to them, for all that teach them, for all the bus drivers and the school personnel. It seems like every month we are hearing of a school catastrophe. Put your loving hand on all that go there. For those who are feeling lost, disenfranchised, angry, let people recognize that they are in a bad place and move to help them. And for the rest of us, make joy sing in our schools these days and let all rejoice in learning more about this world. We pray for Norm Gilman, we pray for the fitness club owner, and we pray for the freshmen, all of whom are going through life challenges. Mostly, God, we pray for our world and for our churches. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and put your new and right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and sustain in us a willing spirit. We know that we can stand firm in the storms of life with your presence and guidance. And we can pray this, because Jesus showed us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let's sing three verses of one of the great hymns of our faith. Standing on the promises. Do you think it might have been church? Thank mm -hmm. you.